Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. Today, we're going to be looking at the case that has been so often requested for me, and that is the case of Jody Arias. Now, just so you know, I'm not going to dive real deep into the backstory of all of this because there is already an excellent video out on that, which is coming from JCS Criminal Psychology. I've linked the video below, so if you would like to be able to know what this case is and all of the details centered around it, go check that video out. He does an excellent job at research, and it saves me a little bit of time. So today's video is going to be centered around the body language of Jody Arias in a few different instances. I was going to say two, but there's a few. That being said, I suppose I can give a small timeline. Back in 2006, Jody Arias met Travis Alexander at a conference. They didn't have an immediate connection, but they kind of flirted back and forth until they developed a relationship. Then things got messy from there in the following years to where eventually there was a breakup and Travis said some things and Jody said some things and he eventually didn't want to have anything to do with her, but kept up sexual relations with her. And it was, it was, it was, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess all the way around. But the issue is, is that Jody became a little bit stalker-like. She became very obsessive with Travis, showing up at his house uninvited, watching him just sit and do things. Very creepy, kind of stalkery style of things, which didn't settle well with Travis, but it still also didn't discourage him from keeping up intimate relations with Jody. Long story short, we boil down to the day of the incident. The day of the incident. And it gets, it gets bad. They go through this entire time of intimate relations, including photo taking, which that comes into play and I'll explain why in a second. And then after the photo taking, it is shown that Jody grabs a knife and I'll let you fill in the rest of the story for sake of content guidelines. I won't tell you what happens, but it happens 27 times along with a gunshot as well. Now, Jody then leaves that crime scene, goes off into some other place, calls Travis's number to try to give herself an alibi, and then continues on about the day. People start suspecting Jody because friends weren't a big fan of Jody because she was so obsessive and hovery and stalker-like. So the police start investigating her, and the biggest issue is that she, in fact, had tried to destroy said camera where the photos were being taken and they were explicit photos and they were able to find said camera in the wash machine of Travis's apartment. The camera was in the wash machine and the memory card had been formatted or the photos had been deleted. Now, most people don't realize, but just because you delete an SD card, it doesn't mean that the information is gone. In fact, you can even pay a small fee online and recover said photos from said memory card. Jody didn't understand that. She thought that just because she deleted it and watched the camera, that that would be enough to get rid of all the evidence. It was not. The law enforcement recovered the photos and in the metadata of the photos, they found the timestamps, which put Jody at the crime scene irrefutably. So this is one of those cases that I'm not here to tell whether or not she's guilty. I am here to tell whether or not we can see from somebody who lies so well, if there are any nonverbal tells that could have helped enlighten police at the time. This is one of those cases that we have the wonderful privilege of 2020 hindsight and concrete evidence proving her guilt. But that being said, there is still stuff to learn from how she presents herself and the psychology around the entire case. I'm going to go through this and analyze, like I said, a few different clips. I know that there are parts that you want me to analyze and I will do it because why the hell not? I know that there are parts that you want me to analyze from the initial interrogations, because why not? They're interesting and they're almost comedic in their theatrics. But then there are more nonverbal tales to be able to pull out from an interview that's a little bit later where she's in jail. And it's the first interview that's televised and there's people all around her asking her questions. And it shows a lot about her psychology and hopefully we can learn a little bit about her body language. But with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and dive into the video right after I roll this boppy intro of mine.
you wanted this. This is, this is what you wanted from me. You wanted me to look at this area, which I'm going to be real honest here. I don't fully buy the idea that Jody doesn't know there's a security camera in the room. Most people expect it. She even brings light to, you can see on the little side table here, there's two sound recorders there. She even brings light to those. So she knows that oftentimes these are being recorded. And also there's a segment in the footage where it looks as if she's looking directly at the camera. I feel like this is a show. I feel like this is a show that she's putting on. I don't have any proof for that, but it's the only really plausible explanation for this. She has very strange behavior that doesn't line up with any other behavioral patterns. Throughout the rest of her interview, she's acting very eclectic, very eccentric, and over the top. It's very theatrical and forced. We'll watch the rest of these really weird things that she does here just so you could see it, but I'm gonna tell you right now, there's not really enough to work off of non-verbally here to be able to say whether or not it's true or not, and it doesn't really matter. It's not really a learning instance, it's absolutely just a what the hell kind of instance. <laughs> Forced laugh. That laugh is very forced, it's not humor-based, it's just a forced one, which is what also led me to believe that she's just acting insane for the camera, which Jody tried to pull off a persona the entire time, and it was this idea of personas that she tried to pull off that really made this interesting for me on a psychological standpoint. She tried to elevate Travis, she tried to tear down Travis, she tried to lie, she lied multiple times throughout multiple different fake and proven wrong alibis all the way across, just clambering across a poorly done crime that was just a catastrophe. My bet is, is that she has always been able to manipulate her way through whatever system that she's working in, and she tried to do so here and realized that most of the time law enforcement doesn't care what your manipulation is, they just wanna to get to the truth and they will do whatever they can to get to that truth, and they did and Jody is where she belongs. This is just a shit show. This entire display, the interviews, everything is just a catastrophe. If you haven't watched that video that I suggested you watch at the beginning of this, go, go and watch it before coming back here. I know that that's not really convenient to click away from a video to come back to it, but I promise you it's gonna be worth your while and you will get more out of this video from that. But let's watch the rest of this carnival of a display. <laughs> Different day here. Back on the day before now. Another Rise fake laugh. The Bible says, and yes, I'm Christian. I just live my life by the Ten Commandments, and that's my, those are my rules. Da, 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 da. You know, thou shalt not this or that, but it doesn't say thou shalt not fornicate. So I just, I just used to joke about that. It does specifically say thou shalt not murder though, so I think she missed that one just a little tiny bit, as was proven by the DNA and physical evidence that was at the scene. So, sorry, Jody, your Ten Commandments live by kind of thing just went right out the window. Keep in mind, the police are watching this the whole time. They see her doing this ridiculous, stupid stuff. At some points, they even consider coming in and interrupting some of it, but they just sit there to find out, like, what is she gonna do next? I understand, out of even just sheer curiosity's sake, she's presenting herself like a buffoon, and 
It's ridiculous. Just all the way around. I actually really don't like Jodi Arias. I have a lot of trouble being appreciative or unbiased with Jodi Arias. She's very self-centered, very, very materialistic. She's concerned about how she looks, how she presents herself. Even in very important times, instead of asking important questions about the case or about Travis, she asks things like, for instance, when she's about to have her mugshot taken, it's not a concern of the fact that she's about to have her mugshot taken for the suspicion of murder, she asks, uh, can I put on some makeup so I look prettier during my mugshot? Like, why? Oh my god, why? So I really don't like Jodi Arias. But that being said, I do have the mental capacity to be able to look at it and still gain some academic usefulness from her ignorance. So with that in mind, we're gonna look at this interview that was carried out right shortly after the incident. It's only a matter of days or weeks here. And maybe we can draw forth some of the micro expressions that she could have leaked, possibly. Let's see what happens. And we'll just analyze the shit out of this thing. I guess that's really all I needed. Sorry, don't roll the tape yet. <laughs> Jody, how did you- Right off the bat. Nobody cares what you look like, Jody. You're a suspect of a brutal murder. Get over yourself and stop being so self-absorbed. From this point on, I am gonna be a little bit more level-headed, but that, it's just stupid. Did you meet Travis and when? Um, we met at the Rainforest Cafe in um, the MGM Grand in, in Las Vegas. How long ago was that? That was in September of 2006. What was it about him when you saw him that kind of drew you to him? You know, there wasn't really any initial magnetic attraction. Um, at the time, I shook his hand. He said, hi, I'm Travis. I said, hi, I'm Jody. And his, his name was just another of, of many names that I had to remember. I was meeting hundreds of people that weekend. So she's rehearsed this story, or she's very good at ad-libbing a story. She's adding in details that we don't care about. Don't care that she met a lot of people that weekend. We asked how she met Travis, but she's adding in these details. And she has this pattern, this verbal patterning, where she hopes to be able to divert attention from questions at hand with side stories and rabbit holes and all of these other things to where it's messy to try to keep her on track. Now, during the initial interrogations, the interrogators do a good job at playing the good cop, bad cop, cutting through her crap, so to speak. But on this interview, she just gets to kind of run free and go wild with all of her side stories that nobody could care less about. But speaking on verbally, right now, this is where she's presenting pretty synchronized body language. When she's saying a no, she's shaking her head. Whenever she's recalling something, she's looking off to the side and squinting. All of these are genuine expressions and gestures. And this just means that she's telling the authentic truth here. And it's true. This is how they met. And this is what she did. So her body language is showing that. That just means that later on, perhaps when we see a variance from that, be it a nonverbal positive spike or a nonverbal negative spike, it could be an indicator of deception. At very least, it's an indicator of extra psychological mental processing. Let's keep watching. Um, we were all there for a big convention, and so um, it was right after I had finished eating with a group of people, and we got up and shook hands with a few people. He was among them, and then we began to walk throughout the casino, and he made it a point to keep walking next to me and keep me engaged in conversation and we just you know by the time we made it around to the big gold line in the front of the lobby we just we had discovered a couple of common interests and that sort of thing how did your friendship to develop more um well we um we hung out throughout the weekend had a lot of fun um exchanged phone numbers and it was one of those things where i didn't expect him to call um but he called me the very next day and so i was like oh hi and you know we just he, he's a good conversationalist he just kept me so she has a genuine flash of happiness centered around talking about Travis. And this goes in line. There is a very difficult blurred line between hatred and love oftentimes. And chances are she really does love him explaining the genuine happiness expression that comes from talking about Travis. It's not hard to cross that line into hatred, especially in the kind of relationship that Jody and Travis had where she's obsessive and he's off-putting. And there's this weird dynamic. It's very easy to cross that line. It makes sense psychologically for her to have gone from I love him to I'm going to 
destroy him in the physical and mental sense of the word. So you can see this genuine expression of joy on her face, but so far the rest of it has been pretty neutral body language, not any positive or negative spikes, even in general speaking. So let's just keep watching to see what else happens. And engaged in conversation constantly and, you know, he wanted to know about me and people like to talk about themselves. So, you know, it was just one thing led to another and we became great friends. Did you two work together? Um, we worked together on occasion. We were with the same company, but we sort of worked in different departments. Is that how so you two met at the same? Um, yes, we went, we met at, at a convention where our company was. This is what Jody is living for, by the way. Attention. This is all that she wanted was attention. She wanted attention from Travis. She wants attention in work. She wants attention from cameras. She wants attention as best as she can. She's very, very self-centered. Very, very self-centered. And it's made obvious throughout the many, many, many interviews and interrogations that she went through. It comes up again and again and again. So this is obvious. So you could see her just drinking in this attention. She's got this coy smile on and you can just feel it. You can feel from her that she loves getting attention. That's her goal. Let's keep watching. You mentioned that you guys love to travel together. Tell me a little bit about where you travel. We traveled to, um, the first major place we traveled to was the Grand Canyon. Um, we went there on a few occasions, have a super So during her recollection, she regularly looks away, be it to the side, be it down, be it up. She looks away to recall. This is good because this is what people will commonly do. Not all the time. If there's anything that you need to take away from this channel, the Observe channel, is that that body language is not universal all the way. There are some universal things, but much of body language is specific to each person. One thing that is general, but not all the time, like I said, is that when people are recalling something, it's rare that they will look directly at a person's eyes because they have to visually process their memories or audibly process their memories to go through to find out what exactly happened. So when she's doing this, this is just showing that that's how she recalls. We've seen it multiple times already. So if there's a point where they ask her to remember something perhaps related to the case and she doesn't break eye contact like that, mm, that's suspicious. That's just going to be suspicious. I don't know. I really don't know if she does that here. I haven't really actually watched this interview because I wanted to maintain as unbiased a perspective of her body language as I could before making this video but this is what we're unearthing so far. So far from what we could see from her baseline, it lines up with just a very general baseline without too many variations from that. Let's keep watching to see if that stays consistent or not. Hi, uh, with some friends and we went to Sedona. Um, we went all over New Mexico. We saw the Carlsbad Caverns, we saw Roswell, we saw um, the Balloon Fiesta, we, we went to uh, a spa that was kind of renowned in Santa Fe. Why was he a good traveling companion? Oh, he was a great traveling companion for many reasons. Um, traveling with Travis was kind of like traveling with your own personal comedian <laughs> and, or serenader um, or philosopher. He always you know, had great things to talk about that would, that would make you think and he was always bursting out in the song. And, um, Still seeing the same genuine happiness expression centered around Travis. This is just hammering home that idea that she really did have an unhealthy infatuation with Travis that she would characterize as love or affection, but it really was just an unhealthy obsession. But she's feeling the genuine happiness about talking about Travis. So that means that she did care about him. Does not excuse her for what she did because that's still in the same ballpark if you remember from earlier. He was a very funny guy, so there were never there was never a shortage of laughs. And so and he was just a great person to travel with. He had an enthusiasm and a lust for life that, uh, you know, we always wanted to see what was around the next corner. And so I, I... Here's the interesting thing, is that she's not showing grief. They're talking about somebody whom she presumably killed, but she's showing no grief centered around that, no sadness centered around that, and she's not necessarily going to. It's very hard to pin down what a person would normally do in a situation unless you've been in that situation or you have been able to extensively study the person. Now, I have been able to do neither of those. But that being said, we're not seeing any subconscious leakage of any negative emotion. Specifically, look at her eyes, look at the corners of her nose, look at her mouth, look at her forehead. 
there's just nothing that's happening on her face that could be an indicator of a negative emotion. It's either blank or happy. She's having a great time getting the attention or she's just reciting facts. There's no guilt, there's no shame, and it's odd to me. It just bothers me a bit. I think that was something that um, we both shared. Can you talk a little bit about your faith? I know you had mentioned in the previous interview that he actually baptized you. Uh, he did. Yeah, that? the reason um, when a person is, is baptized into the church, they, they generally are able to choose the person they'd like to baptize them. And the reason I chose Travis was because he was very instrumental in, in, in bringing me into the church. And he was the first person to share the gospel with me and, and, and give me a copy of the Book of Mormon. And he challenged me to read it, and, and I did. And, and um, you know, it was a decision that I made. And, and I could tell he was very honored when I asked him. And, and he, you know, of course, was, was happy to do so. so. Baptizing, I think, is, is a is a is a really, is, it's a sacred um, thing. This is interesting to me. Verbally speaking, I don't fully buy that she really bought into her faith as much as she was presenting. And JCS actually talks about this a little bit, that she feels like that if she presents this God-fearing persona to people, that they might buy into her lies a little bit more. And it never really worked for anybody. But speaking on her verbal patterns that she uses here, Things like I made that choice and it's a very sacred thing and these extra details that are in there, it almost feels to me and would raise a red flag to me if I were in the situation of an interviewer that she's compensating, that perhaps that's not what she really buys into, nor does her life live up to that. She doesn't have a pattern of faith. She has a pattern of doing what she wants and whatever she feels like, regardless of whether or not it could even be considered criminal. I don't believe that she bought into her faith as much as she's trying to present. I do believe that it was partially a ploy to win Travis over more so, if that makes sense. People will go to all lengths to be able to get the person they like to like them back, and I feel like that was the case here. Friendship go into this relationship that you shared? Um, we just continued, to, we lived I lived in Palm Desert, California. He lived in Mesa. So our, our friendship was really over the phone every night, you know, when all was said and done. Um, when his day's work was done and my day's work was done, that, you know, he would inevitably call and, and we would talk for a while, anywhere from, you know, half hour or it was sometimes it would end up being four hours and then we'd fall asleep and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, with time, it just kind of progressed into a little bit more and a little bit more and, until we decided to make it more official. And then you two actually ended up moving in together, didn't you? No, we never lived together, actually. Um, I spent a lot of time at his house, and um, we spent a lot of time... Bracing gesture there. This is just a sign of her feeling lightly insecure about being in front of so many cameras, despite you could see on her face that she's enjoying it and engaged. The feet and the legs are oftentimes some of the more telling areas about a person because you rarely think of them. For instance, if you're standing in a group of people and you want to know who's involved in the conversation and interested in the conversation, look at their feet. They will likely be pointed towards the conversation. If they're facing outside of the circle, that's really their subconscious showing you where exactly they want to walk, which is outside of it. So if you're talking to somebody and you look at their feet and it's facing away from you, go ahead and cut the conversation short because they're bored or uninterested in the conversation. It's hurtful, but it's very telling. So when it pans down and it shows her kind of cradling her own knee like that with fingers interlaced, this is just a light blocking, embracing gesture. It just shows a little bit of insecurity, which is more what she's really feeling in light of all of the cameras rather than her face, which she is very attuned to displaying deceit with, if that makes sense. She's, she's used to lying with her face, not so used to lying with her feet and legs. I hope that makes sense. You mentioned that you really respected his opinion. I did. Yeah, especially when it came to um, um, just knowledge of the gospel, things like that. Um, all of that, all, all of the resources that one needs can be found on a website like LDS.org. Um, but he kind of gave me a more personal perspective on things. There were some questions where I just was like, why? Why this? Why this? And, and he was able to answer those. Were you in love with Travis? 
Did they ask anything about where you could find information on LDS.org? No. No, they don't. But this is another example of where Jody will try to throw out extra information to distract people's attention away from the issue at hand. She does this with the interrogator. She does this with interviewers. She does this everywhere. And it's also part of her trying to really hammer home that she's this faith-seeking girl, which she's not. She's just, she's not but she's really trying to hammer it home, so she's spouting facts and rabbit trails and all this about the faith. This is just another example of what she does, that what she did, and if you are in a relationship with somebody or a friendship or any level of relationship on any level with somebody and they do this sort of thing whenever there's a conflict, try to ignore the rabbit trails that fly off because it's just them trying to manipulate you away from the issue at hand. Don't let them do it. Stay strong and make sure that you know what you're wanting from it. That's just all that we can really draw from that right now. Um, I think that being in love and loving someone are two different things and there was a point in time where we were in love but it was short-lived. Why did you guys break up? Um, there was sort of a breach of trust in our relationship. So when they were talking about the being in love part and she said it was short-lived, she has a little bit of contempt slipping into her face. She has negative emotions about that, but also she has this feeling of moral or intellectual superiority. And that just all flows. Many people feel contempt about their past relationships. Not a big deal, but still something to take note of, I guess. Part or his part? Both. You guys can move past it? Um, no, not, we really couldn't move past it, um, and... But you guys managed to keep dating. We didn't date per se. Little bit of disgust coming across her face there, and I don't know why that is exactly. That's just what's presenting to me. There is the distinct possibility that it wasn't as balanced as she claims it was, and maybe perhaps Travis was pulling a little bit harder to get out of things than she was, and in fact, that is what many of Travis's friends and family would say. So it could be discussed in relation to the fact that he pushed her out more than she wanted to. I'm not sure, that's just what I see and what a possible answer could be. On the part of um, both of you guys, or? I would say, on my end, not so much jealousy, maybe a sense of insecurity, but that's just me. Um, on his end, sometimes, um, I don't think it was warranted, but I took it as a compliment. <laughs> I was reading, um, I think it might have been his last note to you, May 1st this year, and it said, you know, you're one of the hottest people he knew, and you must be making your town a lot hotter for being Oh, there. yeah, he said the, um... Little bit of self-conscious, self-preening gesture there. That moving of the hair. Her hair didn't need to be moved. It's a preening gesture. She's aware of her self, the way she looks. And you can see though that she's not too ashamed of it. She does look away, which is a common flash of shame, but it's also used intentionally for people who love to receive compliments about themselves. They will try to play up the, oh, don't, don't give me compliments. I feel so ashamed. But do you, have you noticed like how pretty my hair is as well? But don't compliment me on it. And that kind of gives that vibe from her that she's happy to receive those compliments. And chances are she sought after those compliments often, especially considering how materialistic she is and how self-absorbed she is. So even during this instance here, it's not pure shame and discomfort. It's this forced fake, oh, don't compliment me kind of behavior that we're seeing from her. Problems with, with, with the problems in your relationship in those five months start pretty much immediately or was it three months into it or kind of um, help us was, understand that? It was pretty much our relationship. Um, it was just an average. I don't want to say average. I, nothing is average with Travis. Um, but any problems that we had, they, they occurred really right toward the end and, and that signaled the end of our relationship. It's nothing that we continue to dwell on and try to work out. Well, we hmm. A lot of holding of the gaze there. She's not doing a lot of recollecting. Now, this doesn't mean that she's lying. Obviously, there's no universal tell that she's lying, but it is odd that it breaks her pattern from earlier, her earlier nonverbal pattern, whereas she recollects something, she looks away. So this indicates that either one, she's lying, 
or two. She's rehearsed this and knows this so well that she doesn't have to really recall it. So far, everything else she's really pretty regularly had to recall, except for now. Now she's really holding gaze pretty steadily and not having to recall. Why that might be, I'm leaning towards she's lying, but there's not any concrete evidence for that. That's just my initial feeling from what I'm seeing her non-verbally display. In town or were you? I was in Wairica, California. When was the last time that you saw Travis? Where were you? I was in wherever, California. And she doesn't break any eye contact. This is something that she has likely rehearsed a lot. And we also know that it is complete crap. She was indeed there. There's physical evidence on so many levels, uh, irrefutable physical evidence on so many levels that she was there. And here's the thing, either one, somebody had to go through such extreme links, both inside the law enforcement and outside the law enforcement to frame her for killing Travis, or she did it. That's the only two options. Her behavior is so mellow, so even, so level-headed that it, came across as odd to the people. There's still some leakage, as we've seen, there's some leakage here and there, but it was so level-headed that it was wrong. It was off. And that's what many of the law enforcement picked up on, and that's why they were so suspicious, so on and so forth. But it's just a fascinating aspect to me. But let's just keep watching. Jody, why do you think investigators believe that you killed Travis? Um. Well, there's a lot of forensics suggesting that I was, um, you know, in his house. Um. There's not just a lot of forensics, Jody. There's pictures that were recovered from an SD card that the metadata, which you can't really change very easily, says that it was timestamped for the time right before he passed. It's irrefutable. And... I can't. You know what? I'm actually going to wrap this up because this could go on for hours and hours and hours. And right now we're, we've already pulled what we can from Jody. It's just going to be reiterating the same things over and over and over again. So my analysis, I suppose, is that her facade, her persona, her play acting that she was doing is something that she's, she's very practiced with. It's very smooth. The transition between average her and play acting her is darn near seamless which just indicates that she's done it for a while. My bet is, is that she is masterful at manipulation. She's very good at it. She can talk her way out of corners that she gets into. That means that she would find herself in something like sales or customer service because that's very reliant on your ability to communicate and communicate quickly and think on your feet. And she could do that. But the issue is, is that she has a certain go-to, and when she went to that go-to this time, it fell apart because it didn't work in the circumstances. So when we're seeing her and we can see some of these odd tells from her specifically, specifically, let's talk about the eye contact thing. She breaks eye contact while recollecting, genuinely recollecting. We saw that again and again and again and again. And then when there's these times that there are important questions and she doesn't break eye contact, it is then a red flag indicating that she either rehearses or is lying. And so these sorts of characteristics are something that you can use to see the world around you still. And this doesn't have to be just in relationships. This can be anywhere. Now, the more time you get to spend with a person, the better you're going to be able to read them. So in this sort of instance, I would still need to spend hours and hours and hours with Jody. I have already to an extent, but not nearly as much. And something that I want to make super clear, especially for people who are maybe a little bit cynical of body language and how to read it. Anything that you see on YouTube is going to be a pretty watered down version of what needs to actually occur. It's not a superpower. It's definitely a science based off of gathering data. And once you gather enough data, then you can get to an answer. So as you see this on YouTube and you see me watch a video and it's just a little quick assessment and then I give you some ideas from it, they're going to be inaccurate ideas. They just are going to be because I haven't spent enough time person to person 
learning their behavior. That has to happen. And if you watch another body language analyst or anybody who says that they know body language and they say for certain, this is guaranteed this, that means they're lying to you. They are blowing smoke up your butt at that point because they can't. They can't know unless it's one of those cases where it's like here, I can know that she's lying because we already know she's lying. We did, the case is closed. We've seen the evidence and she's already convicted as guilty. Like there's no question there. But if it's not that, then the person who is analyzing has to spend hours and hours and days and weeks to be able to fully flesh out a behavioral pattern for the person they're interrogating. The more time you spend, the more accuracy you're gonna get. There's the possibility that you can do a quick read quick flash read relying on generalities and perhaps a loose baseline. And it can be accurate. And the more practice you put in, obviously the more accurate it's gonna get. But if you want certain results in nonverbal communication reading, you have to be willing to put in the time. So during this time, I hope this makes sense. If you experience any of what Jody did, her ability to rabbit trail very quickly and dive down rabbit holes at the drop of a hat, her smooth transition to lying, to not lying, and the manipulation therein, the diversion with details, all of these things. If you are in a relationship that the person regularly does that at points of conflict, you need to be able to really stay your ground. Really stay your ground hard because these types of people, that's what they're used to. When things get hard for them, they can manipulate and divert their way out of any situation. She'll smoothly talk her way out of any corner except this one. This one she didn't have the opportunity to because her repertoire fell apart in face of actual interrogation. My ultimate goal here on the channel is for you watching this to be a better person for not only yourself, especially yourself, but also the people around you, the people you care about. That's the goal. Nonverbal reading can be very, very damaging in relationships, but it can also be very, very, very useful and encouraging and really add richness to your friendships, relationships, so on and so forth, if you have that mindset. So I hope that makes sense. And that's my little analysis of Jody Arias. I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, hit the like button and let me know in the comments below. If you disagreed with me, say you're one of the people that are like, oh, well, the photos were fake and the evidence was planted and the the times that she lied were uh, just neg neg negligible in general and she's really innocent and somebody framed her and all this. Let me know. I don't necessarily agree with you right now. I don't think that that's the case, but if you have a really good case and a lot of evidence for it, I'll listen. But right now, Jody Arias is behind bars and I feel rightfully so. And there's a lot that we can learn from her. If you would like me to be able to read another criminal case, let me know in the comments below. If enough people ask for that, then I will eventually be able to run a poll. And if it wins, I'll get around to it. I'm also doing a few other series. There's gonna be the Body Language Evolution series. Next up is gonna be Jack Jacksepticeye on that list. There's also an old series that I'm bringing back in, which is called Just Deduce It. You send in a photo of your desk and I will look at your desk, the stuff on it, to be able to tell you everything that I can about you. It's based off of a mentalism technique that relies on physical evidence and conclusions drawn loosely from that evidence. And I'll walk you through the thought process of it all the way through. There's already multiple videos of that on the channel. If you go check out my channel page, it is the Just Deduce It series consider it. I am only accepting photos from people who are patrons right now because otherwise there are too many photos. Way too many photos. I can't get through all of them. So if you're a patron, then you can message me and we'll talk about getting your photos in for the Just Deduce series. So that'll be coming out here soon. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys. Thank you.